No data, no problem. With the lowest data rates in the country, have extra fun with SLT Extra GB. For more details, call 1212. Tonight, death penalty hang in the balance. Handpicking who to hang is problematic. Already you have been convicted for the trafficking of narcotics. There is a right of equality even when you're sentenced. The move through the eyes of a sociologist. So I, I know that we have to think about the real cause behind the drug-related criminal activities more than punishing only those who have been the uh, criminal loss in this regard. How did they get the money? Parliamentary Select Committee in a twist over how the Sharia campus was funded. An evening of grandeur. According to Matthew, wins Best Picture at the Deranalux Film Awards 2019. Round 3. US President Donald Trump extends the North Korean leader an invitation. All this and much more coming up on First at 9 this Saturday, the 29th of June 2019. Fair and lovely men anti marks cream. From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana First at 9. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. A very good evening and welcome to First at Nine, another than in the 24 Sri Lanka's news channel. I'm Katharina Chang. I want your top story tonight. The general manager of the Bank of Ceylon, Sinat Bandara, says that the bank was not informed that the 3.5 billion rupee sum deposited by a Saudi institution for the controversial university in Bataclo was a foreign loan. This was revealed during the proceedings of the Parliamentary Select Committee probing the Easter attacks yesterday. Meanwhile, Director General of the Board of Investment of Sri Lanka, CP Maragod, also testified before the committee over granting approval to the university. Batiklo campus private limited kin Yapti Samanding with me than Karnatika. Nidas Pahalave, Juni Masa Dolosvenidas. On June 12, 2015, the Board of Investment received an application under letterhead the Hira Foundation. Applicants were MLM Hezbollah and Hiraz Hezbollah. Approval was granted by the BOI on January 12, 2016. Okay. Investment take a Okay, TNA 4.75 billion. The make 4.75 illala. Approval net worth 24 million spent. Karno. The application is TN no ne. Kuhon the may additional money in Nikila. Make anti with a debt. Sir, ever loans with the other account. Loan the loan is approval like a then known. Debt to equity illan ne. Ekane. The ek approval do not the debt to equity. Yes, sir. Ever to approval like a cutter, sir. Bank, bank, a kicking gun, a loan, a pili by the wapi than a gut. अनुमति <laughs> Batiklo campus sekate Lanka Bank we ginun tunak thi no. Mr MLM Hisbulla saha Mr H Hisbulla adhyaksha kora varungane Batiklo campus college private limited ke na aithine na Foreign currency no ayi kiu ham repayment ke na mukut kira thiye na. Repayment ke na sandhana kwat ehm mukut na. Foreign currency available thiye na the me account tuna ta. Rupeeal valing billion na tuna idas mahayak. Roughly twenty five million dollars. ुपयाल <laughs> Dedas Dolahe Vimasanova Arakshaka Matias, Ninjika Kati register Karana. It's a good Jatika Buddhi Pradani, we seen Ahitaka Buddhi Varta, Vaklabadi at 
Kiane, Arakshaka Matian Singh, Tahurgulatino, Mika, Numatakaran, the Berry, in Gioca Cadiator, May Sambandine, Wakawan, we the Denuati Maxiduna. A better Megan than in a hair, summoning Vinny Mokari Ginumak, Evagi Sakakatu to the Akevagi the Akinolang. Mahabank in Bangalore, the Nana may think a Ginumokoma freeze Karanaki. Lanka Bank with Anagani covered the Mega Videsh and I am with the Lakinik. After me, Matek, the Madin Tamaya Pedanaki, Petty Cloak Campus Private Limited Ginumat Amatur. We not Ginumaka Vilatino. Sri Lanka Hira Foundation. Kini ginmata tevilati ano? Million tunsiya dahatunai. A million tunsiya dahatuna kena kora. A Hira apa dene me KYC ek kisi amtane kora liyalati ano adha nayak club ano akila. Nayak na labagatte me ginu maharaha apasu yaviye no hakiya. Sri Lanka Mahabanku anumati ak netang yaviye no hakiya. Ne anumati ane ne? Ne. Apit ne ay milalat ne? Ay anumati ka yavilat ne yavastava. Prime Minister Ryan Vikram Singh reveals that the government has already paid 238 million rupees in compensation for the victims of the Easter Sunday terror attacks. Speaking during his visit to the Zion Church in Batiklo today, which fell victim to the attacks, the Premier said that the first round of the compensation scheme is already complete. Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe today visited the Zion Church in Batiklo, which was attacked on the Easter Sunday. Zion. The army has said that the reconstruction of the Zion Church can be completed before Christmas this year. We have completed the first round of the compensation scheme for the victims with 1 million rupees given for loss of life, while a maximum of 500,000 rupees in compensation given for victims who sustained injuries. Accordingly, a sum of 185 million rupees was paid for 189 victims who died in the attacks and over 53 million rupees was paid for 403 people who were injured. We have allocated 100 million rupees with the cabinet approval to look after 33 children whose parents died from the attacks. Meanwhile, President Maitipala Sirisena's recent statement that he signed the death warrants for four convicted drug traffickers continues to attract international attention, with none of the countries voicing positive sentiments over the move. Despite that being the case, those on the other side of the fence say national needs should also be looked at, especially putting an end to drug proliferation, which destroys generations. First at nine, explore the legal and social implications in moving ahead with the controversial move. President Maitripala Sirisena speaking to heads of media institutions on Wednesday stated that he signed death warrants for four convicted drug traffickers. It gave rise to a debate on the punishment within the country, while the likes of France, Germany, Norway and the UK, along with the European Union, voiced opposition to the implementation of death penalty in Sri Lanka. The UK said the president's move would make it difficult for the UK to cooperate on law enforcement issues with Sri Lanka, while the EU hinted that Sri Lanka's GSP Plus facility will be under threat if the head of state moves ahead with the capital punishment. They all reminded the Sri Lankan government that the country in the December of 2018 voted in favour of a UN General Assembly resolution calling for a moratorium on the use of the death penalty. With his decision to end a more than 40-year-long moratorium on the death penalty drawing criticism, President Maitripala Sirisena highlighted Sri Lanka's growing conviction rate in drug-related offences. He said the menace of drugs is destroying the future generations of the country. With that being a real and existing threat, the question arises as to whether Sri Lanka should heed international calls to not move ahead with the death penalty, despite them claiming that implementation of the penalty would harm the country's reputation. One could argue what good is a reputation if the country's future is in jeopardy. We contacted attorney at law Krishmal Varnasurya to get the legal perspective and implications of the planned implementation of the death penalty. The primary concern before, before the country, I believe, is whether the executive arm will consider it necessary at this moment, whether it's a need of the nation, the national need, to carry out this sentence, and at least, perhaps not forever, perhaps even for, for a short while, that so that it will deter this, this massive menace that seems to have overtaken our society. Now, when we are discussing this, it is also important for us to remember one thing. For the head of state or election as the president to carry out the death sentence, or to nominate the place and time whilst it is lawful, it is not lawful for us to decide on whom 
the death sentence should be carried out immediately. For example, if there are 20 people that are on death row, and if we decide that it's only those who are involved in the drug trade, or those who are involved, or who have been supposed to be involved in, in, the, in the trade of narcotics, that I shall kill first, then remember that that will visit the, the right of equality that's in the constitution. Because whether you have been convicted and sentenced for death for any other offense, such as murder, child abuse, or any other offense, or whether you have been convicted for the trafficking of narcotics, there is a right of equality even when you're sentenced. So what does the sociologist think of all this? The penalty could be one of the best social deterrents which can create a kind of a, a fear among the people uh, with regard to the criminal activities. But it's not the only way to control the whole criminal behavior of the people. Now, we know that the, there are a lot of power behind the, the uh, drug-related uh, criminal activities in Sri Lanka. So we have to understand who are really behind this issue. Other than that, we can only give the death penalty against people who are arrested in this regard, but that could be a one solution. So I, I know that we have to think about the real cause behind the drug-related criminal activities more than punishing only those who have been the uh, criminal of in this regard. We have to go to the, the beginning of the issue. We are touching only the end of the problem. Otherwise, what would happen is like a... Uh, we know that uh, the people, those who are economically and politically powerless, they will become the victim of the death penalty. People, those who have economically and political power, they will uh, use their, their legal power as well as the political power. They will save themselves from this death penalty. And also we have to think about the international community and also think about the Sri Lankan culture and also about the, the political economy of the country and the power factors and subcultures, all that. Leader of the opposition, Mahindra Rajapaksha, alleges that the U.S. is influencing Sri Lanka's judiciary. Speaking at a public gathering in Matra, the opposition leader also pointed his finger at having an advisor in the country's parliament who is remunerated by the United States. <laughs> We were accused of influencing the judiciary, but former Chief Justice Mohan Piris didn't know until a letter came informing him that he's relieved from duty. And then they put Mrs. Bandarnayake in that chair by force. Looking at promotions and appointments today, it's evident that some seem to rise rather rapidly. There are instances throughout the judicial system where seniority was not considered when making appointments. There is an issue today where the judiciary is having to give wrong verdicts when erroneous laws are introduced by parliament. And within that, exists an infringement on law, but the laws are formed by parliament. There, however, is a bigger issue where the U.S. judiciary has started to infiltrate our judicial system. There is a U.S. advisor in parliament and he's paid by the Senate. If we really need him, we could have created that position and ensured his payment. But he's paid by the U.S. and is placed within the Sri Lankan parliament to do whatever he does. It is better to express opposition to these by this association, including on the SOFA agreement. <laughs> And with that, we cross over to a short commercial break, but make sure you stay tuned for more local news right after that. Well, the seventh edition of the Rina Lux Film Awards organized by Derina Media Network in recognition of the contributions made by artists of the Sri Lankan cinema industry was worked off at the Nelum Pokhana Theatre in Colombo last evening. The most coveted award, the best picture, went to renowned Sri Lankan filmmaker Chandran Ratnam for his movie, According to Matthew. This is the 7th Derana Lux Film Awards. Derana Media Network, which introduced new dimensions to Sri Lankan media culture, organized the Derana Film Awards in 2011 to felicitate and recognize the artists of Sri Lankan cinema and their work. Nelum Pukuna Theatre was filled with glitz and glamour last night for the 7th Derana Lux Film Awards.
25 films which hit cinemas last year were considered under three categories, which consisted of 18 special awards by the jury, there in a cinema of tomorrow, and seven popular awards. Sriyani Amarasena, Errol Kelly, Budi Kirti Sena, and Anoma Raja Karuna, as well as Nadika Guruge, featured in this year's panel of judges. Bandhu Samara Singha won the award for the most popular comedian. Samanali Fonseca was awarded the Best Supporting Actress for her role in Davina Vihangun, while Mahendra Pereira backed the Best Supporting Actor also for Davina Vihangun. Shalini Taraka became the recipient of the Lux Glamorous Star Award, while Nainathara Vikramarachi received the award for Best Upcoming Actress. Udari Varnakula Surya was voted the Most Popular Actress, while veteran actor Jackson Anthony won the award for Most Popular Jackson Actor. Anthony. Yes. Anoma Janadari won the Best Actress Award for her role in Devina Vihangun. Anoma Janadari. Darshan Dharmaraj backed the award for Best Actor for his role in the movie Puri Sadhya. Thank you. Thank you very much. Veteran actor Amarasiri Kalansuriya received the Lifetime Achievement Award for his immense service to the Sri Lankan film industry. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award, Mr. Amarasiri Kalansuriya. Another round of applause. Oh. King Ratnam, who directed the film Komali King, received a special award from the jury for infusing hope to Sri Lankan Tamil cinema. The award for the best screenplay was given to Gara Sarapa, written by Jayanta Chandra Siri. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the second award Mr. Chandra Siri is winning tonight. He won for best. Play. Sanjeeva Pushpa Kumara was adjudged the best director for Davina Vihangun. Professor Sunil Ari Ratna's Yashodara backed the award for becoming the highest grossing movie of 2018. According to Matthew, directed by Chandran Ratnam, won the coveted award for the best picture. The best film of 2018. According to Matthew, let's have another round of applause for Chandran Ratnam and his crew. Derana Lux Film Awards 2019. In the local news now, trade unions of the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation charge that if the government does not allow the repair of a five kilometer oil pipeline from the Colombo Harbour to the oil storage terminal in Colon Nava, it, would be, it would, could halt fuel supplies uh, to the Minister of Power and Energy for Monday. Their warning comes at a time where Minister of Power and Energy Ravi Karuna Naika intervened to haul repairs in the area where the dilapidated pipeline is located. Ceylon Petroleum Corporation, meanwhile, says the oil pipeline is at risk of exploding. Five years ago, the government carried out an initiative to rebuild a dilapidated oil pipeline from Colombo Harbour to the oil storage terminal in Colon Nava. Almost all of the five kilometer long pipeline is laid so far with only 140 meters remaining. Speaking at a media briefing recently, Treasurer of the Executive Officers Union of Sipetco, Manoj Jayavardhana said that if a leak in the pipeline occurs, the destruction will be far worse than the Mithotamulla tragedy. He went on to say that when they were conducting the repair, Minister of Power and Energy Ravi Karnanayaka intervened and halted the process without evaluating the risk. On the 24th of this month, however, renovation work of the pipeline came to an abrupt halt when residents who illegally occupy an area about the pipeline launched a protest. The army started laying the pipeline. We then informed Minister Ravi Karunanayaka and he came here along with the relevant secretary and asked to stop it. He promised that he will first provide us homes before evacuating us. There are around 20 families who have already been given residences. They promised that they would give the remaining 110 families homes in three months, but seven months had passed and nothing has happened. Meanwhile, members of the National Trade Union Federation charged that there are no houses in the area in which the pipeline is to be laid and the necessary space has already been allocated by the former governing authority. The union which lamented the safety in the area further added that the pipeline is at the risk of exploding should even a cigarette be accidentally dropped in the vicinity and in the days to come the country will be faced with a situation where oil could not be unloaded from tankers.
Should this situation take place, they said the full responsibility will fall on the shoulders of the government and Minister Ravi Karuna Naika. The union added that if the government fails to take any action within the next 48 hours, they will hold fuel supply to the Ministry of Power and Energy by Monday morning. This, they say, will affect electricity supply as generators depend on fuel. Managing Director of the Ceylon Petroleum Storage Terminals Limited, Abdin Muzammil, said that if measures are not taken to quickly rebuild the pipeline, it will pose a grave issue to the country. And with that, we cross over to a short commercial break, but make sure you stay tuned for new news on the other side. Inducted Chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, Dr. Hans Vijay Surya, laments the current state of the economy, saying that it is imperative for Sri Lanka to catalyze a wave of economic resurgence, which envisions an economic growth rate of 7.8% within the next five years. Meanwhile, speaking at the annual general meeting of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, founder and president of the Sarvodhya Shrimadana movement, Sri Lanka Bimane, Dr. A.T. Arya Ratna, highlighted the recipe for a successful socio-economic and political system in the country which he says has witnessed a breakdown. The Ceylon Chamber of Commerce yesterday inducted Group Chief Executive Officer of the South Asian Region and Corporate Executive Vice President of Dialogue Axiata Group, Dr. Hans Vijay Surya, as its new chairman during the 180th Annual General Meeting yesterday. The event also saw the induction of several prominent business persons to the board last evening. Our positioning relative to peers also throws the headlights on national competitiveness and the question whether we as a private sector have focused sufficiently on building competitive advantage as a pathway to growth. If we are truly the engine of growth of the Sri Lankan economy, we need to be resolute in our belief that as a collective, we have the capacity to re-mobilize a growth trajectory which it at least is on par with our regional peers, if not ahead and more rapid. It is hence imperative to catalyze a wave of economic resurgence and to do so with positivity and determination. Resurgence which envisions the return to growth rates of 7 to 8 percent within the next five years. Resurgence which also places us in a leading position in terms of growth, competitiveness and social development indices. In fact, today 17 committees within the chamber ecosystem are working on bringing together a private sector-led action plan towards reaching a hundred and forty billion dollar economy combined with 7% growth rates and regionally benchmarked social development indices by the year 2025. And as drivers of the economy, we need to seek out and eradicate all those instances of social inequity which underlie the imbalances and disturbances to our macro environment in the medium and longer term. It's a time where we all have to get united. I don't agree at all with the present economic theory and practice of the West. I told this to the World Bank in 1974, land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship, bring them together, produce more and more. Those four things are wrong. It's not land, it's nature. It's not labor, it's human personality. It is not capital which our governments create overnight, it's social wealth. It's not merely entrepreneurship, but science technology and wisdom. These are the factors we have to bring together. Now when you go to a village, you don't find out whether they are Sinhalese, Tamil or Muslim or whoever. They are human beings. So we learned from the people that they have a human need which could be classified into ten. And every sub-need was some kind of way a man livelihood could be created. This is not in Western theory. This is actual practice on the ground. Then I tried to incorporate this whole thing. I remember in 74 or so, when I was asked to come and explain what I was doing to the World Bank, they sent a <clears throat> team to study it. And in 1994, the World Bank report carries this, how 175,000 people were provided employment this way. 
But then I could not convince these idiot idiots who were running the governments. Nationally, we could do six things. One, get a spiritual kind of psychological environment where people could live together and feel that we are one nation, one people, kind of national identity. Then certain moral values, then cultural. Based on the spiritual, moral and cultural foundation, social, economic and political system should work. If these three are not there, the kind of mess into which we have got here today is bound to happen. Those of us who believe that need-based economic development and those of you who are following the Western system, we should get together now. The EU and a South American economic bloc, Mercosur, have clinched a huge trade deal after 20 years of negotiations. EU Commission Chief Jean-Claude Juncker said that it was the EU's biggest deal to date. He added that it showed the EU stand for rules-based trade, given the fact it comes at a time of trade tensions between the US and China. Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro said it was historic and one of the most important trade deals of all time. Mercosur consists of Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay and Paraguay. Venezuela is also a member but it was suspended in 2016 for failing to meet the group's basic standards. The deal aims to cut or remove trade tariffs, making imported products cheaper for consumers while also boosting exports for companies on both sides. It is said to create a market for goods and services covering nearly 800 million consumers, making it the largest in the world in terms of population. On to international news, U.S. President Donald Trump has invited North Korean leader Kim Jong-un to meet him at the fortified area that divides North and South Korea. In what Trump is described as a spontaneous gesture, he said on Twitter he could shake hands and say hello with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un during his visit to South Korea. North Korea has described it a very interesting suggestion. Following the G20 in Japan, Trump will discuss the flagging uh, North Korea denuclearization talks in Seoul. Now, if Trump and Kim were to see each other at the delimitarized zone, it would be their third meeting in just over a year and their first since the summit in Vietnam broke down in February. Now on to other international news. Uh, the United States is set to sanction any country that imports Iranian oil, saying there are no exemptions in place. The U.S. Special Envoy for Iran, Brian Hook, said yesterday, adding that the United States would take a look at reports of Iranian crude going to China. Speaking at a media briefing in London, Cook added that Iran does have a history of using front companies to evade sanctions and enrich the regime and fund its foreign adventurism. Uh, Iran has rejected diplomacy too many times. The United States, for more than a year, at the level of the President, the Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, range of people, uh, that we are open to talks. But Iran keeps rejecting this. And so we have intensified our sanctions. We are trying to restore deterrence, to reestablish deterrence against Iran. We are also putting ourselves in a position where if we are attacked by Iran, we can respond with military force. But that is only if. I know it, it would seem that Iran is also probably trying to scare the global oil market so that it can have an increase in the price of oil. There's many reasons. Iran is also trying to keep the world on edge by these attacks. And this is why we have continued to deepen Iran's diplomatic isolation and to intensify the economic pressure. We have seen more nations recognize the risks, reputational risks of doing business in Iran, and I think that's part of the reason why you've seen a decline in investment. But certainly our sanctions that we've made clear that you can't do business with the United States and Iran, and everyone has chosen the United States over Iran for a number of reasons. On to the ICC Cricket World Cup, where Afghanistan are taking on Pakistan. Electing to bat first, Afghanistan scored 227 for the loss of nine wickets. Asghar Afghan and Najbullah Zadran both scored 42 runs each. Chasing 228, Pakistan are currently on 155 for the loss of five wickets. Meanwhile, in the day's second match, it's a replay of the last World Cup final between defending champions Australia and New Zealand. Opting to bat first, the Aussies are currently on 243 for the loss of nine wickets.